Now that we've covered the definition of an ideal, what I'd like to do now is take a look at the definition of a factor ring and then let's work through a handful of examples. So let's start with the definition. If R is a ring and I is an ideal of R, then the cosets of I and R, written R mod I, happen to form a ring with additive identity I and the addition operation is the same as it was for factor groups. So when we take two cosets a plus i and we want to add that to b plus i, what this should be is a plus b plus i, uh, the way that it was just way back in group theory. The thing that's new here is we need to figure out how we're going to add a multiplication structure into r mod i. So when we take the, L, the cosets a plus i and b plus i and we multiply them together, what we're going to define that to be is the product of the elements a and b plus i. It's going to be that coset, a, b plus i. And in this case, because we've taken what we, the group r mod i, we knew it was an additive group, and we've defined this multiplication structure on it, this is now called a factor ring of r instead of just a factor group of r. Now what I'd like to do is I'd just like to justify why that multiplication definition makes sense. So if we were to take the cosets a plus i and b plus i and FOIL them out, what we would obtain is the element little ab, the set ai, the set ib, and the set i squared, where just a word of caution is advised about i squared. i squared is not the set of things of the form little i squared where i belongs to i, but it's rather the set little i times little j where i and j belong to i. So the i and j can be different. We're looking at all possible products, not just squares of individual elements. However, uh, since i is a subring, we're taking i squared, which is an element of i and another element of i, and we're multiplying them together. So what we're getting is another element of i. So this set i squared is a subset of the set i. And similarly, i is an i ideal, so a is an arbitrary element of the ring, but we know that a times little i belongs to i no matter what i is, and similarly little i times b belongs to i no matter what i is. So these three sets that we have, the ai, the ib, and the i squared, each one of them is individually contained inside the set i. And i is a subring, so we're allowed to take elements of i and add them together, and what we're going to get in that situation is just another element of i. So when you look at this, the last three terms in that sum and that we've foiled out, this ai plus ib plus i squared, what we're getting is a subset of i. So we can take all of those things and combine them together, collapse them into just the set i, and we know that when we take the cosets a plus i and b plus i and multiply two elements from there, what we're going to end up with is an element of the coset a, b plus i, and this is the justification for why this definition is the way it is. Now, if you're working through this in class, you know, this still may seem a little bit abstract to you, but I've given you a worksheet in class that really focuses on why this is the proper definition of the multiplication and uh, why we need i to be an ideal of r instead of just a subring of r, why we need that little bit of a stronger property. Now next I'd like to do a couple of easier elementary examples with factor rings and in the next video we'll take a much harder example and we'll work through it together. So some of the easy examples are z mod nz is a factor ring of z when n is a positive integer. So back in our first collection of videos when we started talking about what a subring is we noted that z mod nz is not a subring of the integers because we technically had to change our operations of addition and multiplication to modular arithmetic, uh, modular addition and modular multiplication. And I said there is a relationship going on between these two rings, and now that we have the notion of a factor ring, this is the proper relationship. Z mod nz and z are related in that z mod nz is a factor ring, not a subring of the integers. Now if you let r be the ring z mod 4z adjoint i, so r has size 16, something that you should be able to work out. What I'd like you to do is let i be the ideal generated by the element 2 plus 2i. 
When you do this, you should double check that i is really just a subring with two elements, the additive identity 0 and the element 2 plus 2i itself. Now as an exercise, I'd like you to work out the elements of r mod i and figure out what they are. Since everything is finite here, this should be fairly straightforward. Uh, and I can tell you in advance that you should have eight different elements of your factor ring. And that just comes from group theory. The size of the ring is 16, the size of the subgroup is 2, and so you should have eight different elements, 16 divided by 2, in your factor ring. And the last sort of easy example of a factor ring that I'd like you to work with, again, something that's nice and finite, so you can write everything out and make a Cayley table if you must, is an example that I put on your worksheet from class. So this is something that you shouldn't necessarily do independently unless you want to, but you could you know, do with the help of your classmates, um, is you should take r to be the polynomial ring that has coefficients in z mod 2, and where you do also some modular arithmetic on the exponents, um, where the modu modular arithmetic you do on the exponents is modulo 5. So that's the ring I want you to work with. It ex explained a little bit better on the worksheet. And what I want the ideal i to be is the set of polynomials that don't have a constant term, or in other words, their constant term is 0. This is a nice example of something that you can work out, and you can work out the factor ring, and just sort of play around with some examples when everything is finite, and you can do cover all cases uh, on pencil and paper.